So our first speaker is Nell Zerke, and uh, she's a PhD student at L'Ecole des Mines de Paris, uh, doing things like reconstructing the 3D architecture of the genome. Uh, she's a prolific contributor to Scikit-Learn, Matplotlib, and many other Python projects, and she does a lot of really great volunteering in the community as well. Uh, for example, she's an instructor with Software Carpentry. So uh, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Nell uh, for her talk, Working on a Machine Learning Challenge with Scikit-Learn. So first I'd like to thank the uh, organizers because I'm very excited to be here and um, I always wanted to come to Boston so it's awesome to finally meet you guys, the biggest uh, user group and also the user group with 15% women which is kind of cool. <laughs> so we don't have this in France. <laughs> so I'm going to talk uh, on uh, working on a machine learning challenge with scikit-learn so first a few words on myself so I'm a PhD student I do applied math uh, so machine learning is a lot of math um, but I also work in biology and more specifically on cancer research data uh, I work in a cancer research institute um, and of course, I have also a computer science background and I do a lot of Python and I'm very proud to announce that when I arrived in my team, I was the only one doing Python and now we're free, which is good. Good start. So first, I don't really know um, how much you guys knew about machine learning. Um, so I'm going to introduce a bit what is machine learning, what it isn't, um, why we want to do um, challenges and a bit scikit-learn and I'm going to demo a lot scikit-learn. So first, um, what is machine learning? So machine learning is all about the construction and the study of systems that can learn from data. So um, the basic idea of machine learning that we have data and we want to find a model that explains this well so that when new data comes in, we manage to predict and to generalize from our model. So typically we have 2D data points and we can probably, um, oh, probably in some case, fit, for example, a linear model. And if a new data point arrives, then we may be able to predict either a value or um, a label on it um, or a ranking, for example. And <coughs> there's two big things in machine learning. The first one is unsupervised learning, where the idea is to discover patterns in your data. Um, it's also known as data mining. So for example here, um, I showed an image uh, displaying uh, data points and I've used a clustering algorithm, a very simple clustering algorithm, to detect that they were um, clusters and to group points by cluster. So um, this is, <coughs> like if you know very little about machine learning and unsupervised learning, k-means is probably the things you've seen because everyone implements it. It's like 10 lines of code. So this is what I implemented. The, f the first machine learning algorithm I implemented. Um, the second thing uh, we do in machine learning is uh, supervised learning. So the idea behind supervised learning is to build automatically a function that, mat that maps an input to the desired output. Um, there are several um, goal uh, into doing this. So here we have an example where there are dots, um, some are blue, some are orange. And typically uh, we are going to want to find um, a good hyperplane, a good um, delimiter between the groups that are blue and the groups that are orange. So on <coughs> this example it's like really simple. Uh, you can imagine that when you work on images or things that you can't really visualize well, it's a bit harder. And so the idea is really to have the algorithm learn from the data we give it. So a few applications. Uh, the most common one, ma famous one, would be facial recognition. Um, so if you have like really new phones, now you can uh, train your phone to recognize yourself. So that's typically a machine learning algorithm. Another thing uh, which is uh, quite common is to recognize a spam from a mail. So Gmail does this brilliantly. Um, so they use quite complex models to do this, but um, you can get good results with a very simple machine learning algorithm. Um, something that interests me more is 
inferring the prognosis for a patient based on its genetic profile. Uh, so we have, for example, mutation at different location, and we would like to see to know whether this patient is going to relapse in the next three, four, five years, or we would like to predict how this patient is going to react to some drug. Um, another thing is um, separate different sources, like from a signal. So if you have um, input data from like a band and you want to separate uh, the guitar from the bass, for example, um, this is something machine learning can help. So these are like really different applications. But in practice, well, it's just math. You input data um, numbers, matrices, and you output numbers and matrices. So it's, it can be quite hard uh, for someone who doesn't have a math background to do machine learning. So this is why a bit why challenge exists. It's, um, there's a lot of people who have a lot of data. Uh, so companies, it can be governments, uh, researchers, and they would like people who have a bit of background in data analysis or who are motivated to work on a data challenge um, to uh, solve their problem. Um, typically, uh, I don't know if you've heard about Kaggle. It's a, a startup that uh, provides um, a nice interface and a mean for um, companies to give data to people. And there's maybe each time between 25 and it can go up to 100 people working on a challenge um, and competing to have like the best algorithm that's going to predict uh, swear words in comments on Stack Overflow for example. So um, for, as a researcher, for us, it's also very important um, to have, um, to be able to test like blindly algorithms um, to check which one performs the best. Because typically in research, everyone invents a new algorithm and tells my algorithm is super cool. It beats all the other one. You can see I've done my, my test on my data set. And in practice, they've like tuned the algorithm to work on one data set. So challenges allow um, to uh, blindly separate, to, to rank teams um, on a, a challenge. Um, so this is why I myself participate in two challenges. So um, I already told you my challenges. So typically the client is going to be someone really confused. Everyone tells him, you should use SVNs with this new kernel I've invented and it's like a lot of complex stuff. And someone else will tell him, oh, you should use random forest. It's really cool. And uh, it's a bit confusing for someone who doesn't have a background. I also think that challenges are a great way to get into machine learning. And this is a bit the goal of the talk. Now, how does a challenge work? It's pretty easy. Uh, the company or a research institute provides a data set, which they separate into what is called a training set and a test set. They are going to provide the labels um, so to um, the, the people that want to participate in the challenge. So labels typically is, if you do facial recognition, this image, um, there is um, George Bush on it. Or for a um, more bioinformatics challenge, it can be, uh, we've tested this drug on this cell line, um, and we needed that amount of drug to have some reaction. And so the goal of the person participating, participating to the challenge is use the train, training set and the labels to build a function that will, will well on the test set without having the labels on the test set. So de depending on the challenges, you either provide uh, the method uh, or just the label you predicted on the test set. Now, here is a concrete example. Um, so it's something uh, my team worked on. So it is um, a bioinformatics challenge. So the challenge was to use genomic information to build models um, 
to be able to rank the sensitive of cancer cell lines to a set of small molecules. Um, it was 53 cell lines, um, and we had the training data for 35 of them. So we'll see in the next talk whether that is called big data or not. <laughs> um, we had, in fact, so this 53 samples is like really, really small. Uh, but for each of the cell lines, we had like full sequence, uh, a lot of genomic pro properties. So in fact, downloading the data was already a challenge. Um, and we didn't perform very well on that challenge, but we tried. Now, what about scikit-learn? So first question, who has her heard about scikit-learn in this room? Wow, awesome. So scikit-learn is a machine learning um, toolkit written in Python, which is, um, it's quite new. It, well, it's both new and old. It started uh, in 2008 as a Google Summer of Code project. Um, and the guy that worked on it, so he did the Google Summer of Code, he had a bunch of algorithms going, but then no one was there to maintain it. So around maybe three and a half years ago, um, a French research team decided to take over the project, clean up the code, and make it something that is efficient, but also extremely easy to use, um, and still very fast. So there are pretty go good algorithms in it. Um, there are fast algorithm, it's like C, Cython, it uses NumPy and SciPy in the backend, so there's like Fortran code doing the hardcore stuff. It's Pythonic, um, so the license is BSD, so if you're a company and you want to use it, uh, well, you can without any trouble. And it's really easy to install because the only dependencies are NumPy and SciPy. So I say it's really easy to install, but SciPy can be a bit of a thing. So. <laughs> And it's quite easy to use, uh, especially uh, <coughs> a huge amount of work has been going into designing a API that made it easy to change algorithm in the backend. And I'm going to show you um, three examples of algorithm, and I'm going to demo it. And you can see it's like exactly the same API. And it's also extremely, well, I think it is also extremely well documented. Um, some people may not agree. Uh, so there is a great amount of time going into the documentation, uh, the API, maintaining the code. So despite the fact that it's mostly done by researchers, and I know we have pretty bad reputation when it comes to good quality, uh, it is probably the best written code I've ever seen. So. Now I'm going to talk about the basics of supervised learning. So the idea is quite simple. We input data, which is a matrix. So scikit-learn is going to take a NumPy array as input data. So we have a certain amount of samples that have certain properties. So here, for example, um, I've displayed um, the input data, which is just 2D plots. 2D, sorry, 2D points. So typically, um, the matrix will be n samples time two. Uh, two being uh, the number of features, we call features. Uh, but if you go, like, if you do um, natural language processing, then you'll have, so, a number of samples, and your number of features is going to be the number of wor word in the dictionary. So it's going to be huge, massive. And why is the labels? or the output data. So here we have labels. So some are orange, some are blue. Uh, but as I mentioned before, the output data can also be a rank or it can be a value. And we want to learn f such that uh, on new data, uh, the function f is going to output the correct label. So that's the basic idea for all the machine learning uh, algorithm or at least on the supervised learning algorithm. So I'm going to talk to you about free supervised learning algorithm. So the k-nearest neighbor, um, I'm going to talk about least squares and penalized least squares and random forest. So just quick question, who has heard about k-nearest neighbors? Oh, so you're like all machine learning experts or? <laughs> so k-nearest neighbors is a 
very simple algorithm. Um, it's um, so here I display the same classifying problem um, I had before, and the idea is to make to choose a certain number of neighbors and to make them vote uh, to predict a new point. So when a new point appears, uh, we're going to look at the k nearest neighbors and say, okay, five are uh, orange and uh, two are blue, so the prediction is going to be orange. You can also use uh, the Canius neighbors as a regression problem, uh, in which case um, you're going to have, the output is going to be like uh, a float, uh, a number, and uh, you want to um, make the nearest neighbor vote for, val for the value. So I've displayed two results. Um, the first one is a k nearest neighbor choosing the five nearest neighbor and with uniform weights, which means that they just vote for the value. Um, and the second one uh, weights per distance. So we're going actually to have more importance on the points that are near our um, new point. So I'm going to show you this. So I use IPython uh, in pilot mode. So the first thing is, okay, this really doesn't start well. Demo effect. Okay. Uh, so the first thing is to import our classifier. And I am going to show example on regressor. So from the submodule neighbors, I import regressor. I am going to quickly generate a data set. So let's say 100 points. Sounds good. I am going to create, um, so sorry, I've messed up. So I want something that I can actually use a bit. So, so here, what I do is I create an array, which is um, going from 0 to 99. Um, it's like range in Python. And I add a bit of noise in the output. So x is a bit noisy. We're going to add more noise on the output. And I want the output to be something like 2 times x plus some noise. Uh, we're going to put a lot of noise. If I look at the data, um, <coughs> so it's not that much noise. Okay. So here we can see that, um, so it's grossly like, I could fit a linear model on this. I could do um, linear, uh, I don't know how you call this in English. A line. Regression? Yeah, a regression. So I'm going to try to uh, predict this on new data. So I first initialize my classifier. Uh, I'm going to use like the default options uh, because I don't want to bother about this. And the only thing I need to do to uh, to train my classifier is to provide this input data, which is a matrix, um, and NY, of course. And I know that I'm going to forget something. Okay. So I fit my, my graphs. So let me just explain what I did. Um, I, f I changed the shape of X so that it matches um, scikit-learn's API. So I just uh, it was a vector and I made it a uh, matrix of shape uh, and samples and one, one feature. Now I can predict. So here it's again very easy. I just, I'm going to predict on the same data. Ah. Same problem. Okay. And so I'm going to redo my scatter plot and I am going to plot my prediction. <coughs> so 
So I don't know if you can see, but here is the prediction I just did on the training data. So it's okay, but I know that I generated the data as a just a, a line with some noise in it, so I'd rather have a nice line. So I'm going to talk about uh, linear models. So the basic one, I think everyone has done it before, it's just a linear regression. So all linear models um, are based on the sole hypothesis that you can find um, beta such that, sh such that um, the output um, equals beta times the input and some noise. Um, so I'm going to show you. So I told you the API was simple in scikit-learn. Um, it is like extremely simple in the sense that the only thing I'm going to do here is just create the linear regression in exactly the same way I did the k-nearest neighbor. So I'm going to not bother about options. Um, and then I am going to fit it exactly the same way I fit it the k-nearest neighbor. And I am going to do the prediction. Exactly the same way I did <coughs> the prediction on the previous slide. <coughs> and I am going to plot it. So here it's completely aligned and I can plot this so here, it's much more what I expect from my model. So of course, knowing which algorithm to use uh, pretty much depends on what you're trying to do and your knowledge of the data. So you can't really guess it um, if you don't know how the data has been generated, which you normally don't. So um, now let's consider a case slightly more complicated. Um, so linear, the linear regression I just showed was very, very simple. Now let's consider the case when the number, the number of sample is small and the number of dimension is high. So typically, my case in my challenge where I had a sample size of uh, 53, and it was even worse, so I knew the labels for 35 of them, that's a very small number of samples. And my number of dimension was uh, 75, thousand so it's really really big and the problem is that our data is extremely noisy and that's not specific to our problem it's specific to any problem where machine learning is needed um, so the noise in the observation will intru introduce a high variance so in this plot I showed different uh, linear regression on a subset of a of a data um, so in this case the data was like two points so but you can see um, we find a lot of different lines. They don't really look the same way. So, and this is a problem that occurs, I think, all the times in, in machine learning. So how can we improve our linear model so that we deal with this? So the idea is to introduce um, a penalty uh, on uh, the weights Basically, our linear model is going to find the weights. And maybe we could do some hypothesis and say, uh, for example, that we want the weights to be small, or we want the weights to have a lot of zeros, which means that in our 75,000 of features, only maybe 10 are important. So let's try to spot the 10 that are important and set the rest to zero. And this has actually really good properties, because that means that you can interpret your linear model. You can know which, so in my case, which gene is important, for example, in, in breast cancer. It's, it's kind of cool. So the only thing we do um, to our linear model, so linear model consists in minimizing so this part. So um, sort of, um, if I start speaking about L2 norm, how much people am I <laughs> using? Okay, so we're minimizing uh, the norm of uh, uh, 
the difference uh, between uh, the output we want and uh, x time, uh, so here it's w, it was beta before, uh, x times w and w is what we're trying to estimate. So we're finding beta such that x beta minus y is small. And in addition, so we add a weight, uh, a penalty on beta. So I am going to do demo. So here is the result on the same example as before um, with a, uh, so a reach regression. And you can see that there is much less variance in what we find. So that means that when we're trying to predict, we'll have probably better prediction than before. So, and we can work on smaller data sets, which can be useful. That means you can run it on your own computer. Which is so, uh, exactly the same thing as before. From linear model, I am going to, so I'm going to import lasso because I like this algorithm. And I am going to um, initialize the classifier. I am going to train it. And I am going to predict. <coughs> and now if I do my scatter plot and my plot. So I actually, it, it's really close to the linear model. That's because my example was too simple. But it should be given better results. OK, so the last algorithm I wanted to introduce was random forest. Uh, so who knows random forest? Uh, still a lot of people, OK. Um, so the idea behind random forest is um, to use uh, what we call decision trees. So this is decision trees are very easy to understand. It's basically um, a, a model that's going to ask question to the data. And depending on the answer, it's going to say, OK, you should go in this branch and ask this question. <coughs> so it's really easy to interpret because it's like uh, a doctor looking at a tumor and saying, uh, the tumor is uh, 10 centimeters, centimeters big, and the patient is 35 years old. So he probably has, she probably has, in case of brain cancer, um, this type of gene that is mutated, and so we need to use this treatment. So it's basically the same idea. Now, random forest, um, it's this, but it, it's going to build a forest of trees, um, and each tree is built from a random sample uh, of a training set. So we're going to take part of our data set randomly, uh, and on this data set, we also are going to choose randomly some features. So typically, out of my 75,000 features, I'm going to choose 100 of them. And I'm going to create a tree using this very small subset. Um, as you can guess, this is really nice because you can train a lot of trees very efficiently if you have a cluster. And the very strange thing is that it gives really, really good results. And why would it give good results if you train on like half of your data and half of the features? Um, so this is something that interests a lot people in machine learning. And they've never, they haven't managed to prove it yet in the case that we are, which is like we don't have an infinite number of samples. Um, so in the previous, so I'm not going to demo because it's basically the same thing. You initialize the class classifier, you, you fit, you predict, and scikit-learn is awesome. You don't have to do anything except important different stuff. Um, so one question remains is that I've used the default parameters um, of all the classifiers so far, and it's not really a good way to do. I would, you would like to tune the parameters so that you get good prediction. And to do that, we do what we call cross-validation. So you select a fraction of your data as what we're calling the training set. You're going to learn the model on the training set and then test the prediction on the rest of the data set and measure the error. Now, this is probably, if you ever work on a challenge, this is the most important part. 
um, people who win Kaggle Challenge are people who do this step properly. Um, this allows uh, not to overfit on the data you have so that um, it, your model generalizes well on your data. So cross-validation is really done for this. So this is an important step. And typically, for people who tell you, my algorithm is really cool, it does so well on this data set, um, and you try to reproduce the result, and you're like, OK, it doesn't do that well. Um, they probably, what we called overfit, so they probably neglected a bit this step, and you can see it in real case where you have to predict the output on new data. Um, so again, some code using scikit-learn. Uh, so as we've seen, uh, training predict is very easy with any estimators in scikit-learn. Uh, you just initialize it, use fit, and predict. And cross-validation is also very, very easy in scikit-learn. Uh, you just import uh, the sum model, and you can use uh, a method called stratified k-fold, which is going to return to you your data set split in two. And so you can use this uh, just to, you don't have to bother about implementing this over and over again. So remains a question, uh, which is how to measure the error. Um, so that depends on your problem. I'm going just to give um, <laughs> three example. The first one is on regression. Uh, people usually use the mean square error. So they're going to penalize a lot uh, predictions that are far away from what you want and penalize a little when it's close. Um, classification, so you're trying to predict if your image has a car or a person in it, it's very easy. You just count the number of errors you make. And for ranking, it's a bit complicated. So ranking, uh, typically uh, you want to know which drug works the best on your cancer cell line. Um, and the way you measure usually the error, so it depends, is you select all the pairs um, in your training set and you look if the ranking between those two uh, elements of the pair is wrong or not. So th these are like very basic uh, ways <coughs> to measure the error. They are more complex way. So now I am going to talk about how to then do a machine learning challenge in, I said 10 steps, but actually I don't have 10 steps. So. So the first thing uh, I think is important to look is the evaluation method. Like you want to know how the guys, like you sent your labels, your prediction to Kaggle, but you really want to know how are they going to measure the error? Because this is how they are going to rank you uh, compared to the competitors. And we have in scikit-learn uh, different, um, different metrics to measure the error. Um, you can build your own and use cross-validation on your own metric, and it's really, really easy. You just uh, implement something that takes uh, the true labels and the predicted labels in entry uh, to the cross-validation uh, method, cross-val score, and you can put the classifier, the data set, the target, the number of cross-validation you want, and it's going to compute the scores for you. Uh, so this is also a key point, like uh, winning a challenge is also understanding how they are going to compare you to competitors. And typically, uh, if you do a ranking challenge, it's not the same as if you do a rank regression. So a nice way to do, um, to get uh, the prediction of a ranking challenge is just to compute first a regression and to use the regression as uh, a way to rank, for example, uh, uh, if you have, I don't know, a horse race, um, then you're going to say the first horse arrived in 10 seconds, the second in 12 seconds, and then you can use this to rank. Uh, now, why it is important to have an evaluation method which is uh, specific to ranking is that in ranking, you don't care whether you're far away from the value. What you care is only the ranking. And this may change a lot of things in the leaderboard um, to compare to your competitors. Uh, the second thing is building features. Um, so the data just never comes in the correct format. Uh, just you'll, so I say never, actually it's false. There is a challenge right now 
uh, I think it's on Kaggle, uh, corresponding to the ICML conference, which is a machine learning conference, and they actually provide the data in the correct format. Uh, the reason they do that is because you don't know anything. You don't know what the data is. So it's a very strange challenge. I don't understand why they did it. But usually, so you get images, you get text, you get sound signals, you get mutations, um, and you need to put it in the correct format. So to do that, uh, it's what we call building features. So you need to transform your text into a matrix you can input into scikit-learn or any other machine learning toolkit. So we have a couple of uh, things that should help you to do that um, in scikit-learn. So here's an example for text, um, but it's really, really basic. And if you want, uh, building features is, is an important part of machine learning. My tip is at first, build the features as simple as possible. And we're going to see why. Uh, the first step is to create a baseline. So you choose the simplest algorithm as possible, and you compute a validation score on it. Um, and now you have a baseline to compare all the news, new algorithms to. And this is a really important step, because people usually use some really cool algorithm that just went out. They don't compare it to some very simple algorithm. And it turns out that, well, simple, simple is better than complex, even in machine learning. And often, something very, very stupid will work, work, work better than something extremely complicated. So having a very simple baseline will allow you to know that uh, if you just do a linear model without any penalization, uh, you, you won't do like better than this. So this is really important. So the fourth step is to make sure you can run all the previous steps easily over and over again. Because what you do, you will have to do it over. Uh, you will have to do it over when you want to change the parameters, when you, you want to build new features, when you want to test a new algorithm. And so the idea is to build really um, a code that you can run and it outputs something that you can compare quickly um, to other things. So this, is a s this image is something I took from uh, Olivier Grisel, who's also a contributor to Scikit-Learn, um, and it shows different performance results on a movie review. Um, he did this for PyCon, I think, uh, as an introduction. And it's quite nice because it shows you that uh, using different classifiers, you have different scores. And very quickly, you can see that uh, with uh, some feature selection and a naive Bayesian classifier, you do so much better than with unigram occurrence with a naive Bayesian classifier. So having, being able to output this very quickly, automatically, is super important. My fifth tip is to test all the classifier that match your problem from scikit-learn. It's easy. Uh, you, I've demoed it. It's always the same API. Just take all of them, test all of them, do a grid search to set the parameters, cross-validation, and at least you'll have not one baseline, but 15 algorithms to compare to. Um, and build a performance results board. Last thing is, well, not last, but keep track of everything you do. So it goes with uh, what you do right now. You'll have to do it over and over again. Uh, if you test stuff and you don't really pay attention to what the parameters are, or you only save the results, you end up having a bunch of files, and you have no idea what you use. And typically in a challenge, just being on top of a leaderboard is not enough. You need to provide a detailed description of what you did. If you're not able to reproduce the results, then no one's interested in what you did. So keep track of everything you do. Um, seven points, uh, start reading. So you have a challenge. Uh, you're probably not the first person who's working on a Will's detection problem. So in fact, I'm quoting this example because it was a challenge in Kaggle maybe a year ago. and ICML just published exactly the same challenge. So it's probably good to see what the people who won the challenge did. Um, and it happens all the time. It's also a great way to learn new things, in my opinion. Uh, last, don't neglect building good features. Um, so I told you at first, build the simplest features as possible. Um, but often, just doing machine learning will not help you. You need good knowledge of the data. So if, 
it is possible to win a challenge without knowing anything on the data. Um, I've seen people do this. I don't know how they do that, but it's really frustrating uh, for us. Um, but typically on the dream challenge, we continued working on it after it was done. And we started thinking, OK, we have 75,000 data, data point features. How can we minimize this into something that is maybe useful? And we use what we know about the biology to compute features that are better and well adapted for the problem. And we ran some tests, and we have so much better results. So we should probably have done this before. And it's, in my opinion, it's never over. So I've got a nice compilation problem. Uh, it's not because the challenge is finished that it's over. Um, my tip would be look at what the winners did. Like if you spend six months on something, you probably want to know why the team, you know, in Boston did better than you. Or so, yeah. Read. It's usually blog posts. People like. Uh, bragging when they win a challenge. So you'll probably find something interesting. And some find it can be, it can be quite uh, surprising to see what they did. They, sometimes people win by doing really, really simple things. Um, and sometimes you'll learn stuff about uh, new algorithms. And uh, so it's a, also a great way to learn stuff about machine learning. Thank you for your attention. We have about five minutes for questions. Steven. Uh, you mentioned earlier that challenges are scored according to <coughs> one particular parameter, perhaps, like uh, how accurate your ranking yep. data. But it, it seemed like you were saying that you necessarily train uh, your, your uh, on the test, your algorithms on the test data on only that particular parameter that you're being scored for, which I assume you know in advance. Uh, how do you choose secondary parameters? So repeat the question first. OK, uh, so the question was, um, so I um, said that we should tune the parameters on uh, what the evaluation is going to be done, the metric the evaluation, evaluation is going to be done. And the question, if I understood correctly, was uh, how to choose the second parameter to choose the second metric to yeah. So, um, so sometimes the metric isn't mentioned by the challenge, and it's really hard because you have to guess what they do. And sometimes it's you discover it's something really uh, strange. So part of winning a challenge is also sometimes guessing what the metric is going to be. Um, and usually you don't need any other like if you have a if you can download the code that is used to measure uh, the ranking the leaderboard or the power of your algorithm, this is the best thing to do. You just use this and you don't use anything else. And, uh, but often you have to re-implement, re so you have to understand what's sort of hidden in the text. So. Hi, I'm a fellow grad student um, at MIT Biology here. I'm doing influenza and analytics. And I wanted to sort of get a feel from you you know, how much time do you spend with the data preparation stage versus the, the actual machine learning implementation and implementation stages? So, very good question. Um, in my opinion, I spend way too much time on the data preparation. So, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's something specific to my field, but it's like you always get things in different format, and it's it's really really frustrating. Um, now, um, I do, uh, in my team, we do a lot of feature selection. Um, I consider this as really a machine learning task on itself. So it helps you get better prediction by selecting the few features that are going to matter. Um, but it's often uh, machine learning. Now, there are people in my team that only are mathematicians, and they only develop algorithms, and they don't care about real data. They are going to play with toy data. Uh, I, I I don't like this approach because you often end up with algorithms that work on toy data and that doesn't work in real life, and I think it's useless. But it's a my own opinion. There's also some very beautiful math done behind. So, so I guess it really depends what you're interest, interested in. One more question. 
curious your opinion about the second line of comparisons of uh, Naim or Amiga. Uh, it seems like you said the hardest part about this is getting the matrix for example. Once you have that, there's two tools that will allow you to come through and do the talk. So the question. Uh, so the question was, um, there was a lot of work done in the data preparation, getting uh, the metrics, um, et cetera, and then using classifiers. And the question is, why do I think that scikit-learn is better than other machine learning toolkit? Uh, the question is very simple. Uh, the API is just so consistent over all the classifiers that you can test more things than with um, other toolkit. Now, to be honest, I've looked at um, Orange in in Python, which is most most mostly meant to be used like uh, with a graphical interface. Um, I don't like graphical interfaces. Uh, I like to be able to script to run things over and over again. Typically, graphical user interface don't allow you to do this. There is another one. Uh, can't remember how it's called. It's developed by a Canadian team machine learning team, Ventures Lab. Um, so I, so part of the guys actually contribute to scikit-learn, and I think it's very different. So you'll also find uh, other machine learning toolkits that have very different algorithms than scikit-learn. Now, I think scikit-learn is, in my opinion, clearly the <coughs> best maintained right now. The, the documentation is awesome, and it's the API is just, it really helps getting started on the challenge. So I didn't mention this, I'm going to mention it right now. Kaggle uses scikit-learn um, as a way to uh, introduce machine learning um, and to get people started on Kaggle challenges. So this is shows how uh, easy, it's not only me who says it easy, it's other people also think it. And, uh, so. All right, thank you so thank much. You.